<laughs> All right. Let's turn to the Word of God. We're going to look at Exodus in the fifth chapter this morning as I speak on better, not bitter. Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you made us a born in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Now, these are Jewish people speaking to Moses, the slaves. They weren't happy with what was happening. They were thinking that they were going to wind up incurring the wrath of Pharaoh to the point that they were going to die, die, die. Moses was doing his thing. Pharaoh didn't respond in the way that everyone had hoped, and now they were disturbed about it. They were upset. And so they wanted the process to end, so they confront Moses, and they tell him, look, what you're doing is wrong. You're putting us in a position to where we are going to be judged. We're going to be harmed. Stop what you're doing. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh speaking your name, he's done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Moses talking to God. You know, I have a question to ask you. Have you ever had a moment when you were doing something that was really, really difficult? And you were having a really hard time getting it done? Accomplishing what you were attempting to do? And you couldn't get it done, so you turn and you ask a friend for advice. And they give you their advice. And you go back to apply their advice to what you're doing. And instead of it resolving the issue, it becomes worse. Have you ever done that? Ask a friend for advice and the friend gave you bad advice and it's like, wait a minute. What were you thinking when you told me that? That's kind of like what's happening to Moses here. This is what's transpiring in his life. And when, when you see this happening to him, when there's this aspect of the, the advice from the friends and instead of things improving, they become worse. Moses responded by going to God and issuing his complaint. And you, you hear what he's saying. I did what you told me to do. And instead of things getting better, they're worse. This is hard. Why did you do this to me? And Moses was not a happy camper. He wasn't feeling too good. Or, have you ever had someone say to you, after they become a believer, I was doing just fine before I became a Christian, before I started following God, but then everything kind of blew up on me. And everything is going wrong instead of right. It's like, I can't do anything right. You ever talked with someone where that was their comment? No one here? It's, it was definitely my experience. You know, when I, when I became a Christian back in 1977, you know, most of you have heard this. I came out of the drug culture. I was a rebel <laughs> who would have ever thought it would come back around I, but I was I was a rebel I, I came out of a crazy lifestyle you know was um, just did wild and crazy things for years and my hair was really super long and I wound up getting saved and and some issues resolved really quickly because the people who were discipling me they sat me down and they told me you know you probably should stop doing these things you shouldn't be doing drugs you should stop drinking and I'm like, why should I stop drinking? Well, because you're only 20 years old. It's against the law. You want to obey the laws of the land. Don't get thrown in jail for doing illegal activities and all that. That's not, a, that's not the way Christians act. I'm like, okay. Yeah, and, you know, and, and so I'm listening to them as they're, as they're giving me um, advice on how to live my life. And, and so I started doing a lot of it. But, you know, there were some things that I found to be really hard. And, and it created conflict, conflict in me in a very personal way. One of them was cigarettes. Yes, I smoked. And 
you know, quitting smoking was a lot harder than quitting smoking pot. Did I just say that? <laughs> it just was, you know, because they load up cigarettes with all kinds of chemicals and make them highly addictive. And if you've ever smoked and you try to quit, it's just, it's a really hard thing to do. And I was struggling in quitting smoking. And so I didn't. I tried to hide it. And for the first couple months that I, that I was a Christian, if I was around Christians, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't let them see that I smoked. Not that they didn't know I smoked, uh, because I was the only one who smoked, and I smelt like cigarettes all the time, you know, that type of a thing. And as I was going through the, the convulsions of, of all of that and feeling guilty about it, because I knew I shouldn't be doing it, I knew it offended people that I was around, I just couldn't break the habit. And so this one night we were at a Bible study. It was a, a, in a converted bedroom that, uh, that was used for, for Bible studies, and there's about eight people in, it, in, the, in the room, and I made my confession. I said, hey, guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but I smoke cigarettes. And they were like, oh, yeah, we know. <laughs> and, you know my clothes smelt like cigarettes. And I, my jacket that I used to wear probably smelled like the other type of smoke. Is I, is I, I had this, this, this long army jacket, you know, the, the, uh, the, the big army jackets on the back of it was a zigzag man. I had a marijuana patch here and a 13 over here, you know. Yeah, that, that, I like to advertise what I was and who I was, and that was back when those types of things meant something. It meant you were part of an anti-culture society type thing. And so, you know, I'm, I'm talking to him, and I'm like, I, I, I really want to quit smoking. And so, and I, I knew that it offended people. And I, I figured that out right after I wound up getting saved, because the second Sunday I was a believer, I went to this really, I started going to this really strict um, Pentecostal church. It's where my cousin went, who was the one who was responsible for me getting saved. And I met a couple people who were like me. They came out of my type of lifestyle, and they asked me to go out to lunch with them. And so we're coming out of the church, and on, on the way to the car, I wanted to get a couple puffs in on a cigarette because I was, like, really on edge. If you ever smoke, you understand that. You know, it's like you, get, you have to have your cigarette. And so we get right next to the car, and I... I pulled my jacket down, and I unrolled a pack of cigarettes that were, that, that were rolled up in my sleeve. And I pop out a cigarette, and I take a couple quick puffs off it, and I looked over to my side, and there was a little old lady that was giving me the evil eye. I mean, really, like I'm smoking on her church's parking lot. I had long hair, wearing this, this hippie army jacket, and, and, and I turned to my friends, and I just, I said to one of them, man, wasn't that a blankety blank great message that we just heard and she almost had a heart attack i'm telling you she almost died and and i knew that what i was doing was offending people so that they, they, you know they actually took me out and they talked to me about my language more than smoking and uh, <laughs> why no profane things should proceed from your mouth you know that type of stuff you need to change the way you talk is, you know, I used to swear like a sailor. My family did, you know, at home. I was allowed to swear from where I, when I was a little kid up. And all of a sudden, I'm in this culture where I'm around people like you. And my culture was absolutely the opposite of it. I'm like, oh, man, I can't do anything right. But in time, things began to change. Like when I made my little confession to my friends about smoking, I said, I really need help because I can't quit. And so they said, well, let us lay hands on you and pray for you. So they did. They laid, they laid hands on me. They prayed for me. And as soon as they were done praying, I mean, I kid you not, right as soon as they quit praying for me, I had such a powerful urge to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> and, and so I'm like, no way, man. So I, I pulled my cigarettes out of my pocket, I crumbled them up, threw them in the trash can, and said, that's it, no more. Combination of prayer and that determination, and it was over. It was done. You know, that was it. And, you know, it was, it was kind of like a good thing. But I felt like Moses in this story. It's like I could, early on in my Christian faith, I couldn't do anything right. I spoke the wrong way. I acted the wrong way. I looked the wrong way. But in time, my friends helped to mold and shape my life so that I, I conformed. I became more like everyone else within the, within the Christian church. Went on that odyssey of wanting to be a believer and, and really wanting to become everything that God wanted for me to be instead of what the world had wanted me to be. And the process was pretty incredible. It was just a great thing. But at first, things got worse instead of better. You know, it was just like, it was a really hard thing to go through. And as I 
learned to walk through that process of feeling like that, of feeling like I was, like I was a loser, like things weren't going right, that things just didn't seem to ever want to go right. It was times like that where I learned quickly. I was either going to become bitter or I was going to become better from the pressure that those circumstances created in my life. And I decided I was going to become better and not bitter. And in learning how to walk that out, of walking the Christian faith, of, of becoming like Jesus more and more as I continue in this progression, I learned that pressure, the pressure of life, could either cause me to become better or bitter, and I continue to say, Lord, do not let this make me bitter. Regardless of what it is that I'm upset about, regardless of what it is that's crashing in, regardless of what I see happening outside of me, I want to be better, a better believer instead of a bitter person. And so I'm going to talk this morning about the pressures that cause those types of transformations to, have, to happen in our lives. And the first thing I want to talk about about pressure is pressure encountered. When you look at the story of the Egyptians and how they treated the Israelites for 400 years, you know that the Israelites were under a tremendous amount of pressure. They lived a hard and a harsh life. Egypt had made slaves out of God's people. Now, at this point, 400 years after enslavement, God is about to break the chains of bondage. He's about to take those shackles of slavery off of them and set them free. But they didn't like what was happening. They weren't happy with it. They confront Moses, leaders. Moses... You said we were going to be free, and they're making life harder. You said it was going to get better. They're going to kill us, and we don't want to die. We would rather be slaves than dead. That was their message. They recount the same attitude after they were set free, when they were, when they were going through the wilderness journey, and it looked like they weren't going to have food or water. And they said, Moses, why did you lead, lead us out here to die? We'd rather be in Egypt where at least we had bitters to eat. We had something to eat, and now all we have out here is dust. In both of those instances of, of that bookend, of seeing the people of God complaining about the action of God in the midst of their lifestyle that needed to change, God moved in and he broke through. He brought them to a place of deliverance. But that place of, of deliverance was a hard-fought place, which is often what happens to us. Because when we wind up in the circumstances of life, we're just kind of trucking along, we're just moving along, we're just being us and living life as it comes our way. We often ignore the things that need to be addressed that need to be shed, that need to change until they begin to hurt us or those things start breaking down in our lives and we wind up having the difficulties around us. Just then, when there's the breakdowns, when there's the hurt, that's when we start to think, well, maybe I should change. Maybe I could do this a little bit differently. Because when we don't address the issues, if we don't address them, we can become overwhelmed by them. And one of the things I know about life is when we become overwhelmed by issues, one of the natural byproducts of that that we allow into our lives is we become bitter people. If you let hard things overwhelm you, you will become bitter. You cannot let it overwhelm your heart. And there, there's all kinds of things that lead to bitterness, according to Scripture. Some of the things that can lead to bitterness are unforgiveness. When we don't forgive others for their infractions against us, we will build a cage of bitterness that will keep us trapped as long as that's the place we're, we're, we're willing to live. You see, forgiveness is, is like, it's a crazy thing, or unforgiveness. Forgiveness and, and unforgiveness. Because when we do not forgive others, what happens is we break relationship with them, Right? We've all seen it happen. We, we have broken relationships when we're unwilling to forgive for whatever the infraction is, and all of a sudden we're no longer in communication with them. We go incommunicado. When, when that state is entered into, the person that we broke relationship with or they broke relationship with us because of unforgiveness, they 
don't know what's happening to you. They're out of your life. And if you hold on to that unforgiveness toward them, what then happens is that unforgiveness, it builds a cage that you have the key to originally. And you enter into the cage, you shut the door, you lock it, and you throw the key beyond arm's reach. And all of a sudden, you're trapped by your own unforgiveness. And the only way to get rescued is for someone to hand you the key back that you threw away. And that's where the process of forgiveness comes in, of us forgiving others. This is why Jesus said, unless you forgive others the way that you've been forgiven, you're going to have all kinds of problems. You won't inherit the kingdom of God. You won't have the goodness of God manifesting in your life because you have trapped yourself, that key that opens up the blessings of heaven, that opens up the goodness of God. You put it out of your own reach. And so what you have to do is go back to the first love principles. Go back to the things that you learn in the beginning. You have to go back to the place of saying, Father, in the same way you have forgiven me, I release others from their infractions against me. And the really cool thing is, as Jesus comes, he picks up those keys, he drops them back in your hand, you're able to open that cage, walk out into freedom, and move on with the rest of your life. Forgiving others. Because if we don't forgive, we will become bitter. I mean, I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but I think most of us understand this, where we have bitter relationships with those that we have not released. Lack of grace is a huge thing that brings about bitterness. You know, if we're not acting graciously toward one another. And that, that ties into the area of forgiveness. Or when we get rejected, huge, huge contributor to bitterness because no one wants to get rejected. You know, no one wants someone to kick in the teeth. It's like, wait a minute, you know, you hit me, I'm going to hit you, that, that type of thing. And in, in terms of broken relationships, we understand that rejection, the power of rejection is a really, really potent thing. And if you've ever been through a broken relationship, let me encourage you to please let that root of bitterness be taken out of your heart if there are vestiges of it so that it doesn't, be, it doesn't continue to be the dominant force in your life and other relationships. You know, it's something that has to be done away with to allow you the latitude and the freedom to move forward in your relationship with Christ. Anger, huge one. Judgment, suffering wrongly at the hand of others, all of those are potential creators if not builders of a bitterness into our hearts. And scripture tells us why we get bitter. I mean, James wrote, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So acting appropriately in wisdom and gently. But there's always those big buts in scripture. If you have bitter if you have bitter, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambitions in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. It's a hard issue. And if you ignore it, you're lying against the truth. You're denying the state that you're in that needs to be acknowledged in order to gain freedom and to walk out. It's the unresolved conflict is a powerful, powerful enticer for the fruit of bitterness to manifest in life. That was what was making the children of the, of, of the promise bitter before Moses. Exodus 1 says, they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. What that passage tells us is this is what the world does. The world will do everything it can to influence your Christian faith, your belief in God, to cause you to not to to cause you to let go of the hope that is within you through its hardship to make you bitter against the one who has redeemed you and that is what we have to guard against to keep us from allowing that to overwhelm us and change us away from what Jesus is making us into and in, in, in turning out what the world wants us to be so that we act just like they do, look like they do, behave like they do. That is a wrong posture for any believer to take. You know, the second thing I want to address is pressure seen. You see, when pressure is seen, 
in this case with the, with the children of Israel, it allowed them to fully see and appreciate what that pressure produced. And that pressure produced an understanding of the work of God rather than the work of the flesh. See, one of the truths that emerges in the conflict between Israel and Egypt with Pharaoh is that God wanted something for his people. He wanted them to be free. He wanted them to be, be redeemed. He wanted them out of bondage. But he did not want them to be freed without understanding that their freedom was gained, not at their own strength, not at the strength of Moses, or at the weakness, the weakness of Pharaoh. He wanted them to understand that their freedom was coming simply and exclusively from him and him alone. He did not want anything to embellish that. He didn't want anything to block that. He wanted them to understand that he is God and that he is capable of delivering anything, anyone from anything at any time. The ability of Moses had to be put in the back. And so the protracted conflict that had to happen, that kept the people of God from, wor from worshiping God had to happen so that they would not switch and worship Moses because of the great thing he did. And we understand this to be a truth because if you read the whole life of Moses, you know at the very end of his life, when the children of Israel were crossing over the River Jordan, going into the promised land, Moses died without going in. And when he died, God led him to a place where he died alone with no one knowing where he was. And scripture tells us the reason why that happened is God had him die alone where no one knew where he was at so that the people wouldn't gather his bones, put them in a shrine and worship Moses. You see, only God is to be worshiped, not a man. Only God is to be glorified, not a man. And God is establishing that principle here at the very beginning and it carries throughout the story of scripture. Even to, the, even to other, other aspects or uh, parts of the story. You see, God was extending mercy to the Egyptians in the same way that he does to all nations and all people. He was extending mercy to them, but they refused God's extension of mercy and grace. They refused it. They turned away from it. They said, no, we don't want it. And I want you to understand this. When mercy is spurned quickly... When mercy is spurned quickly, mercy will transform into judgment. Because we resist what we're not willing to let go. Jesus used that principle as an illustration of the story of the man who was forgiven much, as in a massive, massive debt. The man that he owed the money to, called him before the courts, said, I don't have it. He threw himself at his mercy. The debt was reduced. The man was set free. He goes outside, and he sees someone who owes him a small amount of money. Places, this is a figurative aspect, he places his hands around the man's neck and says, pay up, pay up, pay up. I don't have it. I don't care. Pay up or go to jail. The man who owned the original note of the massive amount of money found out what happened. He called the man back and said, whoa, wait a minute, deal's off. You're going to extract that small amount when I forgave you the great amount? Well, uh, sorry, man. The debt's reinstated off to jail, which is where he went. And it says that he was subjected to the torturers because of his lack of forgiveness. Same principle manifests in Jesus with the, the, the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. In that story, Jesus says something that is reflective in the story of Moses and Pharaoh. Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The Pharaoh was given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to keep worse from coming upon him, but he rejected it. And so it just kept piling on, piling on, more and more and more. And life became a living hell for this man. All the way to the point where the firstborn in the nation died before he relented. But before God would allow his children to allow bitterness 
to turn their hearts away from God, God moved in and rescued them at the right time. And Hebrews reflects this years later. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. You see, this is the Lord speaking, say, don't let it come up, don't let it happen, because if it does, it's going to defile you. It's going to mess you up. Don't let it happen. Reject it. Push it away. Do everything you can to keep from becoming a bitter person. Don't let the harsh circumstances of life transform you and change you into less than what you're supposed to be in Christ. The third thing that I want to focus on this morning is pressure's promise. You know, pressure is a good thing. Pressure has a way of releasing what is hidden under the surface. When Moses kept approaching Pharaoh with the request to let my people go, Pharaoh responded, yes, 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 but always with conditions. You can only go so far. You can't take your wives and kids. You can't do this. You can't do that because he wanted them to come back to slavery. The conditions that Pharaoh was granting tethered them to that life of bondage. And what happens is, is Pharaoh would change his mind over and over again about freeing the people. Something really bad would happen to the hand of God. Okay, I'll let him go. And then, well, on second thought, if I let him go, who's, who's going to wash the dishes? Who's going to tie my sandals? Who's going to build the pyramids? Who's going to do this? Who's going to... No. You know, who's going to do the labor? I'm going to have to do it. Uh, wait a minute. I have palm olive skin. I can't do the labor. I have no calluses. Send them back. Let's make them do all the work like we've been doing. And so the, the thing became redundant. And he would start to let him go, and then he would retract. Start to let him go, retract. So God took over. God hardened Pharaoh's heart to convince Pharaoh to give up the people of God, and eventually it worked. And the, the beautiful thing about this is you have to understand, Israel existed under a cloud of oppression for 400 years. The world will place a cloud of oppression over every one of you. That is what the world does if you let it do that. It will place a cloud of oppression over you. It will press you down, and it will bring misery to you every single time. You know, they existed under a cloud of oppression, but this is what happened when God intervened. Instead of living under that cloud of oppression, Israel came out of Egypt under a cloud of God's glory. And they found an, an extravagant freedom that was granted to them. Their lives changed and changed powerfully. Peter, in 1 Peter 4, writes this, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Not just joy, but exceeding joy. Mega joy. I like that concept. And not just because I'm the happy pastor who tells dumb jokes and tries to make people laugh. And who misses it about 99 out of 100 times. I like the idea of mega joy of everyone being happy. And what Peter is saying is he's saying, look, guys, understand this. Pressure has great power. That's what he's saying. And at the end of the pressure comes the joy, comes the release. See, scientifically, we understand things respond to pressure. Earth is under atmospheric pressure. That's the amount of pressure exerted when, uh, against the surface by the weight of the air above it. And we measure that pressure all the time with a barometer. When the barometer moves, if you measure it yourself, you understand. Anytime the barometer moves, things change. Happens all the time. In weather, when the pressure is high, things are better. They're good. Pressure creates a good thing in that regard. Because if you understand what happens when... Pressure gets low. We learn moving east. When the pressure gets low, 
Things are about to happen that you may not like. Things like hurricanes, tornadoes, microbursts. We knew not of those things being Californians. They were not part of our lifestyle. The only thing we had to deal with were fires and earthquakes. <laughs> There's always a trade-off. But we learned about microbursts. We learned about tornadoes. We learned about hurricanes and finally went through one. Ain't so bad. <laughs> Moses illustrates that truth taken from nature. The pressure he was under didn't make him bitter like the children of Israel under Egypt's hand or Pharaoh when confronted by God. He allowed the pressure to make him better. And he kept going back even though he didn't like what was happening. He refused to relent. He refused to give up. He said, this is my task. This is my lot. And I will not quit as long as I draw breath. And God allowed him to be made better. Let's apply that to our personal lives. Spiritually, pressure changes things. When you're under pressure, let the pressure make you better and not bitter. Have you ever noticed how people act differently when pressured by the environment, by the circumstances that surround us? Biblically, we can refer to this exertion of pressure as temptation. Do we give in and give up? Or do we rise above the temptation and allow God to bring out the best in us? That is a question we always have to, have to ask of ourselves. What do we allow the pressure to do? And again, I postulate and I present to you, do not let the pressure make you bitter. Let it make you better. When God put pressure on Pharaoh, what was really in his heart eventually came out. And what was in Pharaoh's heart was not good. You see, it tells us something. The heart can be deceptively wicked. When a heart is full of darkness, full of sin, our own heart will deceive us. And this is where we have to understand. We have to know that we need to go before him and ask him to examine our heart, to make our heart as such so that as his eyes go to and fro throughout the land, that they land on us and that we have a heart that is acceptable to him, a heart that he wants to be that type of people. But pressure is the only thing that brings that out. You see, often it is under great pressure that hidden things surface in us or in others. And we see what is under the surface. And when God is putting us in pressure, he's doing that not to call the bad out, but to call the good out, the unseen, the treasure, the gold. Or like what we see around this area, a well driller who pulls water out. Or you go over to Pennsylvania where oil or gas are taken out. Where there is hidden wealth under the surface, it can be extracted. And that's what God does in the power of pressure. He is there to bring the very best of you out, not to cause you to become bitter, but to make you better. That's his heart. I mean, think about Jesus and how he responded under pressure. And like any man before or since, including Moses, Jesus faced down the devil and his system of pressure, and he prevailed completely. Without, without any equivocation. Toward the end of his ministry, in his earthly life, after multiple temptations and multiple hardships came his way, Jesus said this, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, Satan. And he has nothing in me. I mean, can you imagine being able to say that? He has nothing in me. That's what Jesus was able to say. Let me let you in on a little secret. I got a secret. You want to know it? Because you're in Christ, he has nothing on you either. Because you're in Christ, he has nothing on you. Like Moses, the devil used the unpopularity of God's message manifesting in Jesus against him to try to pressure him. 
There's a, there's a point in, in Scripture where we are told that Jesus gave a message that people just didn't like. Crowds didn't like what was happening. They didn't like the pressure from the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious rulers. They didn't like that, and they didn't like what Jesus said. Jesus just happened to tell them, you know, unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you have nothing, no part of me, no kingdom, nothing. And it says that the multitudes turned away from him and they bailed. It was like, this is too hard, this is too much, this is crazy. That's like, boop, more than we could handle. Every sprocket blew. It's in those situations where it's easy to give in, to become discouraged, to become bitter. You know, discouragement and bitterness are a real threat. Jesus didn't give in. In John chapter 6, records this, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The people abandoned him. Jesus could have easily said, hey guys, come back, come on. What are you doing? Where are you going? You misunderstood what I said. Let me apologize and tell you what I really meant. You misheard me. Let me explain. But he didn't. He confronted him with an uncomfortable truth, and he did not back down. Because he didn't, a lesson was learned by Peter and the other disciples. Peter understood that there was something greater than the acceptance of men. There was the acceptance of heaven. And this is a lesson every one of us has to learn. Because all Christians live under pressure. That's what Romans chapter 12, verses 2 is about. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Or as J.B. Phillips translates it in, in his translation of the New Testament, he translates this verse as reading like this, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. When you put something in a mold, you add the pressure to get it to conform. The world wants you to conform to its image. Don't let it happen. The Jewish people, when they were confronted with being set free, when it was getting hard, they, they didn't want that. They wanted to conform to the world. God said no. Moses said no. Moses said, we're going to continue on. And ultimately, they gained their freedom, and their lives were radically transformed by the goodness of what happened. Friends, pressure helps us to learn that we serve God for who he is and not for what he does for us. And when we learn that lesson, we are able to appreciate what he does so much better. So I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm at times shocked at my faulty result in terms of the way that I view God and what I think God should do. It's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That wasn't fair. That wasn't nice. That wasn't kind. It's at that point where I found that he reveals to me his faithfulness to me in spite of what my attitude was, just like he did in Egypt. When we don't learn that lesson, provision can become an expectation in an idol. We're supposed to combat those attitudes by loving him and worshiping him in spite of provision or life's hardship. You see, God takes us through the pressure like he did with Moses and the children of Israel in order to reveal to us our degree of faithfulness to him. See, he'll always be faithful to us. But he's wanting to pull out our faithfulness to him and to make us more faithful, more committed, more capable of pressing on and pressing in. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, as we conclude, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. You know, one of the biggest challenges in our faithfulness to God is seen when we don't get what we think we deserve. 
Delayed gratification is a hard thing to understand. It really is. But I would postulate that his purpose of delay or denying us may very well produce in us something that is better than what we thought we really needed. Let him have his way. The children of Israel had to walk through those, those, those ten trials before their promise was achieved. In each one, they gradually learned that God was greater and greater and greater than the world around them. Let that be our lesson. Learn that lesson. It'll lead you to obedience without resentment and bitterness. It's a good lesson to learn. And so I would say that each one of us, we need to ask the Spirit of God to help us, to help us understand what we need to learn in our seasons of pressure. Because how many of us have ever been in a season of pressure? No one? How many of us, how many of us are in a season of pressure? <laughs> Let me say it again. Let pressure make you better, not bitter. Seek God for his grace and realize that this faith is not a game. It's a life to be lived. And that God is here to draw you into that place of becoming better and where you discard the bitterness that would keep you back. Amen? Amen. Let's lift our hands to our Savior. You know, those areas of unforgiveness, of lack of grace, lack of mercy, of judgment, rejection, all of those things that can allow that root of bitterness to spring up in our life, I want you to think about where those things have impacted you. Just m meditate on it for just a moment. So every one of us have been confronted with those things that have just really hurt. They've hurt deep, they've hurt long, and they have been just a horrendous thing to encounter. Now, as you identify those things in your life right now with your hands raised, I want you to look up here for just a moment, and I want you just to go like this. No more. No more. I shake off the bondage of this world. I shake off the shackles of the wicked one. And I say, no more. No more. I come to you, Jesus. I come to you, Jesus, and I say, I will not live under that oppression. That cloud of oppression has nothing on me. I will only live under your cloud of glory. And I come out of darkness into your awesome and your mighty, magnificent light. That's who I am, and that's where I dwell. And so, Jesus, now set your sons and daughters free of anything and everything that would hold them back now. Father, I speak against those shackles. I speak against those bindings, and I command them off. I command the deliverance of heaven to manifest even now. The Lord, that your fullness, that your goodness, that your mercy, that your grace would just erupt in the midst of your people and that we would see your fullness happen in our lives. Let no root of bitterness spring up that defiles. None. We say none. No way, no how. Thank you, Jesus. Freedom for your sons and daughters. And we bless you and we praise you for this in your mighty name. In your mighty name. If you thank him for the freedom that he provides, the freedom that he has brought to you, just let out a shout right now and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Floodgate, love you much. Go in his strength and his power and might. Be a witness of the deliverance he has brought to you. And let others see how good he is. Amen? Amen. Love you, friends. If you have prayer needs, you can come forward. Our prayer team will pray with you. If not, be blessed, be encouraged, and let his goodness shine through you. Amen.